with infinite copies, potentially, of universes. What are the odds that we would be here asking questions about our own existence? It harkens to the very notion of probability, of choice, and of free will itself. The question has parallels to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics itself is deterministic. We have laws in the Schrodinger equation, which evolves and has evolutionary consequences for the behavior of particles and forces and fields in our universe, some of which may have been instantiated in the inflationary paradigm by a quantum field called the inflaton. The inflaton is like a rocket fuel, because like rocket fuel, it's very difficult to shut off a rocket once it's ignited. And so too, the multiverse seems unavoidable because this scalar field called the inflaton there are tremendous amounts of universes being formed without the possibility for them to be stopped. So a fundamental question that we'll keep coming back to in this discussion is whether or not nature is deterministic or not has the ultimate impact on the question of free will. If nature is deterministic, then you have no free will. Quantum mechanics possesses randomness, but it also doesn't qualify as a choice because there's no choice, there's no agent making a decision to collapse a wave function, the famous uh, example of Schrodinger's cat, and that type of dynamics is well found to be deterministic, and yet the choice to observe the cat comes down to a notion of an observer's free will or not. Now imagine if you had a protocol to decide whether or not you made a choice. Couldn't you make a rubric to assess whether or not you have free will? Well, if you did so by process of elimination, you could uh, estimate that you don't even have free will, even if you have ultimate knowledge of what's to come in the future. Here's an example. Imagine you're driving from Los Angeles back home here to San Diego. You're going down the interstate called I-5, or The 5 here, and as you're going south, you see the cars coming north ground to a stop in Orange County. They're at a dead standstill because of some accident. Now, the people in San Diego just departing are blissfully unaware of their fate. You know their fate absolutely, what they're going to encounter. Does that mean that they have no free will? We all have this elusive notion of free will, we experience it, but is that just an illusion? Even if the multiverse scenario, the paradigm more properly said of the multiverse is true, does that really explain the notion of free will that we experience in our one observable, honest-to-goodness universe. For a long time, leading cosmologists such as Stephen Hawking and Alan Guth envisioned our universe as just one of countless island universes, some with constants very different than the universal constants that we enjoy, the speed of light, the strength of gravity, some with very similar uh, properties of our observable universe. There'd be outliers, and there'd be some that have just the right Goldilocks-like properties to support life that could later ask the question of why is our universe so particularly finely tuned to our existence to ask the question that I just posed. Many physicists find the concept of the multiverse anathema not only to physics, but to all of science. Past guest Paul Steinhardt has even deemed the multiverse the ultimate compound, claiming it's not only bad for science, it's bad for society because it undermines the notions that we have used as a scientific method for over 400 years. But what about the very notion of choice, of chance? That is underlying in a, a notion of what mathematicians call the measure problem. Any statistical ensemble, say you have 52 playing cards in a deck of cards, you can answer the question of what are the odds of selecting a particular card, say the ace of spades. Well, you can answer that because you know the total amount of possibilities, the 52 cards that I mentioned originally, and the ace of spades is just one out of 52. So you know exactly what the probability of drawing a particular card is. But in an infinite number an ensemble, what are the odds of drawing the ace of spades out of every possible possibility in an infinite deck of cards with suits unimaginable? This is a problem that has been plaguing the cosmologists that support the notion of the multiverse. What is typical? What is expected in an infinite number of possibilities? Mathematicians and physicists have been grappling with this, and it's an interesting combination of the primitive laws of mathematics entering into a domain of practicality. For almost a decade now, researchers have realized that this is a vexing and important problem. To accurately predict the expected properties of our universe, the one that we can observe, we need to figure out a way to weight the likelihood, the probability, of observing other bubbles according to the number of observers that they contain. 
This is where the cosmological meets the quantum mechanical, and this is known as the measure problem. So Alan Guth, again, the father of inflationary theory himself and other scientists have sought to measure a way to gauge the probability of observing different types of universes. And in doing so, calculate the distribution statistically of observable bubbles. So how many of each type of universe could arise in a specific time interval? Now, they found a particularly vexing subproblem. The statistical distribution of the number of universes depended on how scientists define time in the first place. Now, a colleague up at uh, UC Berkeley, Rafael Busso, came up with some ways to quantify the likelihood of observable universes possessing observers within them in a way that is related to the problem of entropy. And they call this type of measure an immortal watcher, this observer soars through the multiverse counting different events, such as the number of observers. <laughs> the frequency of these events in their distribution can be converted to a probability of observation. This then solves the measure problem. However, critics point out that this is sort of assuming something completely implausible up front. How does this immortal watcher survive all the different bubbles? It can't be an observer like ourselves. So they compare this to sort of an avatar that has to persist. Alan Guth and collaborators looked at the process that would take place of counting the number of elements if the multiverse was really, really large, but could be granulated into discrete patches. And then you could say that these observers could inhabit these finite little cells of the so-called sample space, as they called it. As the sample space expands, approaching, but never reaching an infinite size. It would encounter different events, such as nucleosynthesis or the formation of dark matter halos, and this observer would count these events in an infinite hypothetical database. You just made the list! According to Alan Guth, that these observers could see anything that could possibly happen will happen, but those events would not all occur with equal probability. So you could have an infinite number of occurrences, but they wouldn't occur as likely for some scenarios as for others. So both the approach of the immortal watcher and this uh, fictitious database, they seem kind of far-fetched. And we seem to observe a preference for things like protons to be the fundamental building blocks of matter, but not uh, some hypothetical particle, my favorite particle, the crouton. The question is, how could you weight the probability of protons versus the fictitious croutons and their probability to be found? So there's a tremendous amount of speculation. And so it all has to come down to quantum mechanics at some level. But quantum mechanics is just a manifestation of the waviness, the uncertain nature of matter and energy. Now imagine, if you will, a infinite wave train, a wave that has to go on forever. That's necessary to produce what's called a monochromatic or monotonal acoustic wave. It takes an infinite amount of time, formally speaking, to produce a single wave of perfectly defined frequency. What's special about quantum mechanics is that it says that matter itself is wavy. It's non-localizable. But does this really imply no free will? What does that really mean, whether or not we have free will? Is it based on being able to predict the future, or is it based upon ability to constrain present choices? What if it's not something we can reconcile with the laws of physics, with quantum mechanics, or even with the laws of philosophy? Can we actually test whether or not we have free will within the bounds of a theory that talks about notions of choices, of quantum mechanical uh, effects and causes thereof. So both the many worlds interpretation and the multiverse have things in common. They have a nexus of overlap, which is this problem of what does it really mean to define a probability to make an event. So Busso looks at this problem and he homes in on a finite patch of the universe that he calls the causal diamond. Pretty cool concept. And he says that that is the largest swath accessible to a single observer traveling from the beginning of time, if there was a beginning, to the end of time, if there is an end of time. In such a causal diamond, the finite boundaries of this structure are formed by the intersection of the two light cones going both forwards and backwards in time. These light cones spread out at the speed of light. If you will, they're all the things that could be influencing the current observer from the birth of the universe, if the universe began at a single uh, moment in time called the Big Bang, typically. And if indeed it proceeds into the future, all the events are in the forward light cone that this particular observer, say yours truly, could influence going forward. Now, because of the causal diamond structure is finite, 
it avoids some of the infinities and formally avoids the measure problem. Since any experimentalist only has a finite life expectancy, or even consecutive generations of an experimentalist, they can only make a finite number of observations. Well, if the assumption that the experimentalist can freely choose the conditions at will, then this is sort of a conundrum that's going to remain. How do we assess the likelihood of probabilities in a universe that may not be singular? In our own universe, are there consequences of the multiverse or of Everett that could be tested to give us some credulity in the probability of existence of the multiverse itself? One of those will be obviously observations of the cosmic microwave background's B-mode polarization with upcoming experiments like our Simons Observatory Small Aperture Telescopes and the recently recommended for funding CMB Stage 4 project, which both have as their aim the revelation, if you will, of gravitational waves produced by inflationary expansion. Now, that would be a powerful harbinger of the inflationary epoch. It wouldn't prove necessarily that the multiverse is true. And there are experiments, as described by Sean Carroll in his excellent Something Deeply Hidden, that could test whether or not the universe has this branching probability at each moment. Both of these would give more credulity to the existence of the multiverse. But for now, one wonders if the multiverse is being taken more seriously than the investigations into either the foundations of quantum mechanics and the notion of what constitutes an observer and or whether or not the universe actually obeys these kind of bizarre properties of many worlds or quantum uncertainty originating from an incredibly energetic event in the universe's past. So. For now, if you've made it this far, you've shown exceptional free will and great judgment. And I hope that you'll continue to go on and investigate more fascinating aspects in future episodes of Into the Impossible. If you love learning about the brain, consciousness, and intelligence, I know you'll love this special playlist that I created just for you. Click here and don't forget to subscribe.